thank you very much. Uh, so I, I wanted to uh, shift the area of scrutiny to what we should be doing uh, in both treatment and the policy field about when we get uh, an, either a poor response or a less than perfect response or no response uh, to the intervention uh, that we're providing. Uh, so the same declarations that I gave this morning uh, about the different areas of work um, with which I've been involved or I'm involved. Uh, I want us to move on from the fact that we're now identifying uh, interventions and treatments where we can make a difference, uh, where we can make the situation better, and to look at how do we deliver those treatments in a way that makes good better still. So we're, we're delivering good with a treatment, but we realise that it is suboptimal. It's less than it could ideally be. Uh, I think it's crucial that we move away from uh, impassioned statements of belief in one approach or another and move from, from a, 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 from a faith-based approach to a science-based approach about moving our field on. And what we're doing is we're looking for levers or influences uh, that enable somebody in their treatment or in whatever intervention they're involved with uh, to achieve more benefit. Uh, in doing that, we need to be comfortable with the fact that there are some areas where we have little or no influence, and part of our job as a scientific community and committee is to be able to look at areas and to realise that some areas there's powerful benefit and others there's very marginal benefit, uh, and we need some sense of the quantum uh, of whatever it is we're studying. Uh, and then we also need to realise there are some areas, some very specific areas, where we have a big influence uh, and we should pay particular attention to those. And some of us were involved with putting together a review uh, document and quite an exciting process of putting together the book that uh, Tom Babel led uh, about drug policy and the public good. Okay, so uh, five areas I'm going to cover. Uh, first of all, uh, I'm embarrassed to have to raise the topic, but we have to go out as ambassadors for the fact that we should avoid moralising uh, about the behaviours of the patient population we're dealing with. Our job is to look at interventions uh, that bring about healthy behaviour change and recovery from the problems that people have developed. That involves developing a strong therapeutic alliance uh, with the patient populations that we're dealing with, but also looking at how we can get more leverage and benefit from the interventions uh, that we provide. Uh, in the UK, we've had a lot of debate about uh, wanting to promote recovery. Uh, some of that debate's been very healthy. Uh, some parts of it, in my view, have been unhealthy and have been counterproductive. There's been a lot of emphasis on the fact that treatment should be uh, to achieve full recovery, and I want to spend a minute or two talking about that. A full recovery is obviously what you want to achieve with anybody in treatment, but how you define full recovery depends on the individual you're treating. Uh, full recovery should be an individualised concept. It's the fullest recovery that somebody can realistically achieve and wants to achieve uh, from the position that they are in now. It is not something that is externally determined, uh, not by uh, public poll, and not by politicians, not by clinicians, uh, but it is determined by the individual in their recovery journey. And there's a danger that we accept uh, a very discriminatory approach uh, to our patient population, uh, which interferes with good medical practice. Uh, so I want to take you through an exercise here to do with, from my own personal point of view, uh, the issue of how does recovery feature. Um, and it's also an opportunity to look at some photographs on a large screen. So uh, I, I personally had a, a viral chest infection about six, seven years ago and was aware I could, I, I, 
I had difficulty going up a couple of flights of stairs and I developed a sinus bradycardia uh, from a post -viral, from viral carditis. Uh, so I was, uh, had a pulse of about 40 to 45, which is an, as an academic, that's okay. Uh, but if you wanted to speak to a colleague two floors upstairs was a bit of a problem. Uh, so at the end of the day, I, uh, essentially my conduction uh, through my heart was uh, interrupted and I had bundle branch block and such, and uh, I had to have a pacemaker fitted. So as I explained to my kids, I'm now bionic. You know, so, uh, now, when I sort of said to colleagues and family and friends, oh, this is great, I've now fully recovered, uh, I, I'm in full recovery, uh, they said, well, in that case, you should celebrate it. You should do something to affirm your, sorry, to affirm your recovery. You should do the London Marathon. Now, this is a ridiculous suggestion because I could never have done the London Marathon and I can't do the London Marathon now. Uh, so I decided I should identify my personal uh, recovery journey. So this is the shame, shameless way of getting your uh, pictures uh, put up on the screen. So... Uh, I, I decided I should cl climb a mountain in Venezuela, a wonderful mountain uh, called Mount Roraima, and I did it as a sponsorship climb uh, and as an affirmation of recovery. Uh, so with my wife and her sister, we, uh, we decided we'd do this. It involved getting reasonably fit, involved some preparation for the event. Uh, because I was working in contingency management, I often offered to double the donation that anybody made. So I had some donation from friends, but I had even bigger donations from enemies who wanted to make me have to, uh, to pay extra. Um, so it, it uh, what punched up Tepwe Mountains in South America. Uh, the, the climb was uh, up this uh, crack in the mountain surface, and it's about a, a three-day climb to get up there. Uh, it, was, it involved a certain amount of preparation. Uh, th there, were, there was a great deal of... I, I, I was very aware that I was affirming the fact that I was um, in recovery. Uh, we were... Uh, other lessons that I learned is that in your journey of recovery, there are some grueling moments, and you should never trust the advice that you're given by other people. So I'd been told that we were travelling in the dry season, so there was nothing to worry about. Uh, this was one point, <laughs> one point in the journey. It definitely wasn't the dry season. Anyway, uh, we, we, we got to the top. There were wonderful life-affirming moments. Uh, we were told that when we got to the top of this Tepui mountain, there would be, we would stay at El Hotel. And so this was, I, I had visions of uh, the Hilton uh, at the top of this mountain. Uh, so this, this was El Hotel. So, um, uh, and... But there were indeed very life-affirming moments. Now, there are lessons from this which have some connection uh, with the talk, apart from the opportunity to show the slides. Uh, so uh, it had to be individualised. My recovery is... Ob obviously, I do not make a recovery back to the health that I had when I was a 20-year-old. So in the, in the journeys of recovery that we're working around with people, we need to... And, and across the whole of medicine we're talking about achieving the maximum realistic recovery for that individual in the position that they are in. It is not something that we externally or politically determine and place upon them. And that's a way in which recovery is being used as a way of doing harm instead of an individualised pursuit of benefit. It's not to do with retention in treatment. It's not to do necessarily with abstinence. Uh, and we should look at how all sorts of treatments, including medications, and maybe I move away a bit, I'll stop <laughs> uh, attacking the microphone. Uh, we should look at how all sorts of treatments, including medications, might assist in that recovery. Uh, it's particularly to do with positives. As a clinician, I tend to focus on negatives. I look for how a harm has reduced. But, of course, for an individual and their recovery, they may attach just as much importance to the, uh, to, to the accruing of a positive. Uh, for those of you who have not read it, there's an excellent monograph uh, from uh, William White about uh, recovery-orientated methadone maintenance, 
uh, pointing out that within the methadone treatment field, we should incorporate a lot of this thinking about um, gaining your own, in making progress in your own, your own personalised recovery. Uh, before you click, before you go online to look at this document, and before you click the print button, it is about three to four hundred pages long. So just um, check that you, you you might want to start with the uh, with the executive summary. Um, but uh, Bill White uh, identifies the fact that how we define recovery has huge implications for the public understanding of the work that we do. And there's a danger uh, that we have a medically and uh, socially stabilised methadone patients end up being discriminated against uh, as a result of the way we frame the treatment. Uh, Bill White and Tom McClellan then worked with the Betty Ford uh, Foundation identifying uh, operational working definitions of what recovery meant around uh, voluntarily maintained lifestyle change. Uh, they also helped us with some work in the UK, uh, in the UK Drug Policy Commission, identifying we're talking of a process through which people go. So it isn't a place that you're at, recovery, it's a, it, it's a process of recovery. It's characterised by voluntarily sustained control over your substance use. Uh, what you're looking at doing is that you're looking to maximise uh, the, the amount of health and well-being uh, that as an individual uh, you can gain. And in particular, you would see that in... Uh, people participating in rights, roles and responsibilities of society. And this has helped in some of the thinking that we've done around uh, the, the positive, positive aspects of reshaping treatment. And we have a report from the UK about uh, medications in recovery and how medications can, on, in, in some situations, help with recovery, and other situations are either no longer necessary or maybe an impediment and the skill of being a clinician working in the field is knowing at what point of time you are in that journey. There is a danger in the lower bullet points here that uh, we will allow external forces of funding or politics or public opinion to drive that process too rapidly. Uh, and by, as uh, was evident from the presentation this morning about uh, overdose risks, if you are allowing those pressures uh, to end somebody's treatment prematurely, uh, you put them into a particularly high-risk situation. Uh, so in terms of defining poor response, uh, in popular parlance, it's to do with helping the individual get better. And uh, getting better is better than where you are now when you hope that the amount of getting better you achieve is great. Uh, so if, as an Englishman, I might dare uh, try introducing a French phrase, well, we, you know, we're looking at making sure that, uh, that the best is not the enemy uh, of a good intervention that we might achieve. Uh, there are partial benefits that are achieved in treatments that are hugely important, especially when widely achieved and widely applied. We don't necessarily need to develop new instruments for measuring this, although there's a lot of effort going into doing so, because we're, we're already well aware of the multi-axial nature uh, of measuring uh, the damage that's been sustained and uh, thereby measuring the amount of uh, recovery people are achieving um, from that situation. And it is a blend of uh, that in most of the... Uh, approaches to measuring uh, people's recovery, there's a failure. Okay, thanks. Yeah, well, I'll move on from that. Uh, and I might take three to four, but I'll do that. Okay. Um, so, we, so we already know about how to improve uh, the medications, but we do need to look at uh, issues around dose and adherence. Uh, so uh, we've already got evidence of clear dose-response relationships and a gradient. Uh, I would draw your attention, there's a small study that Tom McClellan and others did looking at the dose of psychosocial treatments. Uh, so you can actually, just as you do dose studies with medications, you can have dose studies of the amount of support and counselling that, that you provide. And uh, in this particular study, let's just look at the 
the amount of heroin use, uh, just to concentrate on that area, because that's obviously a focal point. Uh, in the minimal support in this methadone treatment, uh, they only achieved 60%, uh, or so you, you had 60% of people still using uh, street heroin at six months, so only 40% had quit. Uh, but in the interventions with uh, a higher level of support or a, or a particularly high level of support, you got much greater benefits. Now, if this was a medication that was doubling the benefit that people had from their methadone treatment, they'd have been holding the front page of the newspapers about it. But because it's broadly in the psychosocial field, we, we fail uh, to realise the, the importance of that area. So... Um, I'm going to actually skip through to the end. Um, uh, in, in reviews of psychosocial treatments that uh, were, I was involved in chairing a group for our National Institute of Clinical Excellence uh, looking at non-medication elements, and the one that leapt out from that was uh, contingency management and behavioural reinforcement approaches. I think we have a lot more to learn in that area. Uh, so my two concluding slides... Uh, so, first of all, there's nothing intrinsically good or bad about taking medications. It depends on the individual and where they are at the point in bringing about the change they're trying to make. Uh, we, we have to lead on this to help the public and politicians and our colleagues understand uh, that uh, whether it's medication support, psychosocial support, uh, Narcotics Anonymous support or family support, we actually need to look at the well-being that the individual is achieving uh, and where they are now compared with where they were before. Now, this is, a very, this is a very fundamental principle of the application of clinical practice, whether it's medicine or whatever branch. So it, it's a very basic principle. It isn't a radical new principle, but we, we seem to be in danger of losing contact with that. Uh, to do that, we need to get better at routine assessment of somebody's status at their entry into treatment and then the periodic review to ascertain how much journey they've made since their original entry and also uh, whether they are accruing further benefit. Of course, the benefit might be the prevention of a, de a deterioration. And as clinicians, we need also to be aware that uh, by ending treatment prematurely, we may inadvertently do harm. So we need to commit to safety net planning so that we are aware uh, if somebody's treatment is uh, being terminated prematurely, in which case we should intervene with a different intervention. So thank you very much.